Hello everyone, in this video I will be breaking down and explaining the story Batman The Dark Knight Returns. One of the most influential and popular Batman comics in history. And I have real personal sentimental attachment to this book, which I will explain in a bit. But those of you unaware or who have not read this book, it was published in 1986 and written by Frank Miller. And before this, Batman was often written kind of cheesy and campy. Think of like the Adam West Batman TV show. And due to Frank Miller's book here, Batman kind of changed and adapted into the more dark, serious character we know him as. And this book was so influential, kind of changing the world of comics and publishing after that. And it really influenced the way Batman was portrayed in movies, whether it be the Tim Burton Batman movies, the 90s ones, the Christopher Nolan ones, or the Zack Snyder ones. So many people just take things from this particular story. This story was also adapted in a two-part animated movie, and it is one of the few DC animated movies where they kind of did the adaptation right and did a good job with it. So... Watch those adaptations, I do recommend them. Frank Miller even got his own Frank Miller Batman connected universe within the comics, and he published a few more stories in this world. Some of them really good, like Batman Year One. Some of them less good, like, uh, what's it called? The Dark Knight Strikes Again. Less good. But uh, still kind of interesting. But uh, my personal experience with this book is it was the first real adult comic book I ever read. It was my gateway to the world of comics. When I was a kid, I read Archie comics sometimes and Simpsons comics, and that was about it. Now, I liked superhero stuff. I liked Batman. I watched Batman the Animated Series. I watched some of the movies, but that was kind of the extent of it. When I was in high school, a friend of mine who did read it was explaining it to me, and he was hyping me for the book. And he explained it as such. He was like, all right, Batman is 55 years old. He's retired. He comes out of retirement and he fights Superman and it ends with this epic Superman fight. And, you know, will Batman be able to outsmart and take down Superman? And there's also Joker in here and uh, Harvey Dent, Two-Face and all sorts of crazy stuff. And it sounded really epic to me. I wanted to read about this retired Batman coming out of retirement and kicking ass. It sounded so cool. He lent me his copy. I read it. I thought it was amazing. And you know, I bought my own copy. And after that, I was like, you know, there's a whole world of these stories out there, of these comics about Batman, about all these characters that continue on the story beyond what I've seen in movies and TV shows. And it made me go down the rabbit hole of reading a whole bunch of other Batman books and then reading other DC stuff and Marvel stuff and then Image and et cetera and reading everything and getting to the place I am now where I have this YouTube channel talking about comics. It all kind of started with Batman The Dark Knight Returns. So just to show how something published in 1986 can be so influential to people years later. So yeah, that's my experience with this book. Uh, let's dive into the story for Batman Dark Knight Returns. I can break down the story for you, and it will be an epic time, so let's dive into it. The Dark Knight Returns, written by Frank Miller, pencils by Frank Miller, inks by Klaus Jansen, and colors by Lynn Varley. Issue 1, The Dark Knight Returns. The book is set in a dystopian 1986 in Gotham City. Bruce Wayne is 55 years old, and he has given up the mantle of being Batman after the death of the previous Robin, Jason Todd, 10 years prior. The story in this book not only deals with Bruce Wayne and Batman and Superman and the various colorful villains, it also deals with society and the media, and we will often see various figures discuss and debate the Batman and vigilantism and the state of society. When the book opens, it is summer in Gotham City. There is currently a heat wave and the temperature is climbing to record highs. Bruce Wayne, sporting a mustache, is racing cars at the raceway and he gets into an accident. He almost dies as his race car crashes and lights a flame. At first, people think Bruce is dead, but 
he managed to escape with only superficial burns. On the news, they report on Bruce Wayne's car crash. And they also discuss Police Commissioner James Gordon. He is almost 70 years old, and he will be retiring in four weeks. A forced retirement, because he will be 70 years old. The news also reports on today being the 10th anniversary since the last recorded sighting of the Batman. He is either dead or retired. His fate is unknown. Some younger people don't even think he ever really existed. Maybe he was just a myth. The debate around Batman's war on crime and the ethics of the vigilantism continue to be argued to this day. We see Bruce Wayne and James Gordon meeting for drinks. They discuss James Gordon's upcoming retirement. They also discuss Batman being away for so long. It is clear from this conversation that James Gordon knows Bruce Wayne is Batman. James even pokes fun at Bruce's old playboy routine he used to do earlier in his youth. Bruce would try to throw people's suspicion from him being Batman by pretending to be this playboy. He would always be dating these young girls, drinking and partying, but secretly having nothing but ginger ale in his glass and leading people to believe it was champagne. James also asks about Dick Grayson, Batman's previous Robin that eventually left to strike out on his own as the hero Nightwing. Bruce says he hasn't spoken to Dick in seven years. James says that's a shame, especially after what happened to Jason. James is referring to the death of Jason Todd. Jason Todd was the Robin that replaced Dick. Bruce, he doesn't like this topic of conversation on Jason being brought up. He tells Gordon they should just call it a night. Bruce, he walks out into the night, going down the streets of Gotham. It is dirty and filthy and ridden with crime. Someone holds a sign saying, we are damned. Bruce, he thinks to himself, I walk the streets of this city I'm learning to hate. A city that has given up, like the whole world seems to have. I'm a zombie, a flying Dutchman, a dead man, ten years dead. Bruce, he tries to ignore the feeling in his gut that the Batman is rising once again, calling on him. He hopes that maybe he will feel better in the morning, as it's the night that really calls out to his Batman side. The sound of police sirens can be heard in the distance. A group of street thugs in a gang called the Mutants have their visor sunglasses on and their knives out. The Mutants are a street gang comprised mostly of the teenagers in Gotham City and they terrorize citizens just for the sake of terror. Two mutant gang members discuss potentially trying to mug and slice up Bruce Wayne as he walks by. But they decide that Bruce looks awfully big, and when they see the look in Bruce's eye, they get a sense that he almost welcomes the fight. He seems into it sickly. They don't want to murder someone who's into it. They decide to leave Bruce alone and head to the arcade. Bruce, he tells himself he will feel better in the morning, but he is reliving old memories that haunt him. Over at Arkham Asylum, we see the Joker quiet in his cell, watching, almost comatose. He doesn't have the typical maniacal look on his face. He just looks subdued. The doctors at Arkham Asylum have done some sort of plastic surgery on Harvey Dent, aka Two-Face. They have healed his scarred face and made him look normal again on both sides. When they reveal to Harvey his new healed face, Harvey tears up. The doctors proclaim Harvey healed, not only physically but also psychologically. They say he is no longer a threat to others and he is free to leave Arkham. The doctors then go on the news and give an interview saying how they fixed Harvey up. Harvey makes a statement declaring, I do not ask Gotham City to forgive my crimes. I must earn that by dedicating myself to public service. For me, this is the end of a long nightmare and the first step on the long road to absolution. James Gordon was not enthusiastic about Harvey's release, calling it a mistake to the media. Bruce Wayne, on the other hand, made a statement saying he is all for Harvey's release. Bruce told the press that we must believe in Harvey Dent. We must believe our private demons can be defeated. Later on at his home, 
Bruce experiences a frightening flashback to a dream from his childhood, where he accidentally fell into a hole filled with bats. When Bruce awakens from his nightmare, it is 3.30 a.m. He has sleepwalked through his mansion, and he finds himself in the Batcave, surrounded by things of his past career as Batman. He has tarps covering almost everything, except one of the main things down there in the Batcave that is not covered. It is the now deceased Jason Todd's previous Robin costume on display, a monument to Bruce's past failure as Batman and putting a young boy into harm's way leading to his death, and also leading Bruce to hang up his cowl and retire as Batman. As Bruce heads back upstairs from the cave, Alfred asks Bruce, What happened to your mustache, sir? Bruce, feeling his upper lip, is a little alarmed. He did not recall removing it. He removed his mustache without even realizing. This signifies Bruce's unconscious intent to return to being Batman. On the news, the report that Harvey Dent is now missing, and James Gordon wants him found. Harvey Dent just got out of prison and he's already up to something. Elsewhere, we see a poker game going on with some unseen criminal figures with guns. Harvey Dent tosses in his signature scarred coin into the pot, and he says he'll see and raise it. Harvey has his entire face bandaged still, covering his healed up appearance. Bruce, he sits down and watches some television. Everything on the news is bad. It only speaks of horrible violence, attacks, deaths, rapes, mutilations. Things in Gotham City are just getting worse and worse. Bruce, he turns off the TV. Bruce is struggling with the internal thoughts he has that are calling him to become Batman once again. He tries to ignore it. He goes and takes a shower. He has memories of his parents being gunned down in Crime Alley when he was a kid. His mom's pearls being ripped off her neck and falling to the ground. Bruce, he goes into his office. He plays his answering machine. Clark Kent, aka Superman, left a voicemail saying, Bruce, it's Clark. Just thought you should know I'll be out of town for the next few weeks. Way out of town. Selena Kyle, aka Catwoman, also left a voicemail saying, Bruce, I'm lonely. Bruce stands there and contemplates his life. As he stands there, a bat flies through the window. This almost serves as an omen from the universe that he should return to being Batman. And Bruce, he finally decides to do so. It is time for the Dark Knight to finally return. The heat wave across Gotham City appears to be subsiding, and a storm starts moving over Gotham City. Rain and thunder are coming down. Violence is reaching a new high. Two teenage girls are walking home. One of them is named Carrie Kelly. She is 13 years old. She will eventually become Batman's next Robin, the first female Robin, but I am getting ahead of myself. The two teenage girls are trying to walk home. They decide to cut through this arcade as a shortcut. They know it is dangerous though, as the mutant gang tends to hang out in there, but they put their fears aside and continue to walk through. As they cut through the arcade, the storm raging outside causes the power to go out. Carrie and her friend have to walk through the arcade now in the dark. Some mutant gang members move to attack Carrie and her friend with their knives. Carrie, she gets saved though by the Batman. Batman decided to finally make this moment his return. Batman swoops down and beats up the mutant gang members, breaking their arms and tossing them around. Carrie, she got home safely. On the news, they report on the incident. Carrie and her friend told the news that they saw a man dressed like Dracula. The news reporters know exactly what they mean, though, that Batman is back. Over the next few days, Batman stops various criminals all over the city, and word of his return begins spreading. Batman at one point is chasing some bank robbers who are trying to get away in their car. The car chase leads to an abandoned construction site where the robbers try and disperse and hide. Batman, he arrives on the scene and he tells the police, these men are mine, signifying that they should hold back and give him time to work. One rookie cop who was too young to be working when Batman was on the scene 10 years ago, 
He thinks it's ridiculous to just hold back and let Batman go on ahead without them. But the veteran cops on the force tell the rookie, Trust us, kid. You don't want to get in his way. Batman, he goes through the construction site, sticking to the shadows. He one by one takes the various robbers down. One robber, Batman attacks and breaks his leg. Batman is not one for subtlety. He is a force of nature. Eventually, the rookie cop arrives on the scene and he finds Batman interrogating the robber with a broken leg. The rookie cop tells Batman, You're under arrest, mister. You crippled that man. Batman replies, He's young. He'll probably walk again, but he'll stay scared. Won't you, punk? The rookie cop tells Batman, I mean it. Get away from him. I'll shoot. The veteran cops arrive now, and they tell the rookie, Don't try it, kid. He's been patient with you as it is. Nice to have you back, Bats. Batman looks through the criminal's clothes he's interrogating. He eventually finds Two-Face's scarred coin. Batman knows this is Two-Face's calling card. Batman, he leaves and tells the cops, Tell Gordon we have to talk. On the news, they discuss Batman's return and how many people he has already put in the hospital. The talking heads on TV debate. One of the talking heads postulates, Does the return of Batman signify the resurgence of the common man's will to resist, a rebirth of the American fighting spirit? The other debater counters, The only thing he signifies is an aberrant, psychotic force, a morally bankrupt, politically hazardous, reactionary, paranoid danger to every citizen of Gotham. While the news discusses and debates Batman, a subdued, almost comatose Joker watches TV at Arkham Asylum. The Joker, on the TV, hears of Batman's return. It causes him to crack a small smirk. And then that smirk turns into a big, beaming smile from ear to ear. The significance of Joker's reaction here is to show us how the Joker and Batman's relationship is really tied together. Without the Batman, the Joker doesn't really exist. With Batman being retired for the last decade, the Joker wasn't really alive. He was dull, subdued. He was just wasting away in Arkham. No motivation to break out and escape or cause shenanigans. But the second the Joker learns of Batman's return, he comes alive again and he smiles. His reason for living and for causing mischief, havoc, and violence has returned. One of the bank robbers that Batman took down recently has broken bones and is in jail. The bank robber has his lawyers confront James Gordon. The robber wants to sue and claims Batman planted evidence on him and wants Gordon to arrest the Batman. Gordon is annoyed by all of this. He orders that that criminal be released from jail. The lawyer doesn't want his client released until Gordon can ensure his protection from Batman. Gordon, he ignores this. He even phones up Bruce Wayne back in his mansion and informs Bruce that he just recently released one of the criminals responsible for the bank robbery. He did this with the expectation that Batman will now go after the man and question him. Bruce is healing at his mansion as Alfred cares for him. He is not as young as he used to be. His recovery time for each injury is now longer. This will not stop him though. Bruce, he suits up as Batman and is going to confront this robber that was released. As Batman is traveling across the city, on TV, the ominous leader of the so-called mutant gang has sent in a videotape to the news and they are playing it on the nightly broadcast. On the TV, the mutant leader is making threats. He says, We will kill the old man Gordon. His woman will weep for him. We will chop him up. We will grind him. We will bathe in his blood. I myself will kill the fool Batman. I will rip the meat from his bones and suck them dry. I will eat his heart and drag his body through the street. Don't call us a gang. Don't call us criminals. We are the law. We are the future. Gotham City belongs to the mutants. Soon the world will be ours. The anchor woman on the news then reports, With that videotape message, the mutant leader whose name and face remain a secret has declared war on the city of Gotham and on its most famous champion. Batman. He has now arrived at the bank robber's home to confront him in his apartment. Before I continue on with this next scene, 
I think it is interesting to point out that Frank Miller said the comic's plot was inspired by the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry movies. So when you see how this next scene plays out and the kinds of stuff Batman is saying, it is straight up out of something in Dirty Harry. Batman, he wants to know what this man's boss is planning. The criminal is wearing a neck brace and is injured from his last confrontation with Batman. And he is scared. He tells Batman, no, stay back. I got rights. Batman tosses the man through his window and tells him, you got rights, lots of rights. Sometimes I count them just to make myself crazy. But right now you got a piece of glass shoved into a major artery in your arm. Right now you're bleeding to death. Right now, I'm the only one in the world who can get you to a hospital in time. The only thing the scared criminal tells Batman about his boss's plan is that it's twice as big as you can ever imagine. Over at police headquarters, James Gordon has had the Batman searchlight reinstalled on the roof, and he flips it on, and the bat symbol shines in the night sky. Teenage girl, Carrie Kelly, the one that Batman saved in the arcade from the mutants many nights prior. She sees the bat searchlight in the sky, and it gives her hope, a sense of purpose. Batman joins Gordon on the roof of the police headquarters. They discuss Harvey Dent's supposed return to crime. Gordon reveals that two helicopters were stolen recently, most likely tied to Harvey Dent. So whatever the scheme is, it will most likely be crime by air. Although all signs seem to be pointing to Harvey Dent being behind everything, Batman is still holding out hope that it is not Harvey and someone else behind these schemes. Batman still believes in Harvey Dent and doesn't want to be proven wrong. Later on that night, Batman is perched atop a gargoyle, waiting for whatever criminals are going to come by in helicopters where he will try and stop their scheme. Batman, he double checks his utility belt. Nerve gas ampules, freezing compound, cable, grappling hooks, stethoscope, painkillers. Yup, all there. Batman uncharacteristically has a rifle with him as well. Two-Face flies in with two helicopters heading to Gotham's Twin Towers. One helicopter lands on a rooftop of one of the towers. Batman, he sneaks over there and he tosses some sort of fear gas to the criminals that make them all scared out of their mind for the next 20 to 30 minutes. Batman then walks right over to the helicopter. Everyone else is too scared to stop him. In the helicopter, Batman finds a bomb, which he then disarms. While all of this is going on, Harvey Dent, in the second helicopter, takes over a TV broadcast and demands $5 million or he will blow up Gotham's Twin Towers, killing everyone inside. Batman then focuses his attention on that second helicopter, the one that actually has Harvey Dent inside of it. That is still flying in the air. Harvey Dent's goons start firing at Batman. Batman, he jumps in the air, and as he is in mid-air, he gets shot in his chest. He almost dies. Luckily, Batman has a plate behind his suit, protecting him from the bullets. Batman, he begins falling though, but mid-fall, Batman, he aims with his rifle, and he shoots at the helicopter, and he hits it, causing the helicopter to lose control. And Harvey Dent, he falls out of the chopper in all the commotion. Batman, he is still falling in the air. He uses his grappling hook. He attaches it to a nearby building and he manages to swing across and catch Harvey Dent in midair, and the two swing into a nearby building through the window. In this building now, Batman can finally confront Harvey. Batman is still not 100% sure it is in fact Harvey behind these crimes, but he wants to know for sure. Sure enough, the bandages that were covering the man's face fall away, and it is indeed Harvey Dent a.k.a. Two-Face. Harvey's face is no longer scarred, it is normal looking, but on the inside, he is now fully the bad side of himself. Harvey tells Batman, Take a look! Have your laugh! I'm fixed, alright? At least both sides match. 
Have your laugh, Batman. Take a look. Take a look. Batman sees Harvey. He sees him. He tells Harvey, I see a reflection, Harvey. A reflection. That is the end of issue one. Harvey Dent has always been conflicted between his good and bad sides. Hence his reliance on flipping a coin and relying on the coin to tell him to either do good or evil, to follow life or death. Now Harvey's, with his face healed, is trying to reconcile his old split face with his new face. Batman looking at Harvey tells him looking at him is like seeing a reflection. Because Batman, like Harvey Dent, knows all about the conflict between living two very different lives. Issue 2. The Dark Knight Triumphant. James Gordon walks outside and smokes a cigar. He is being trailed by a mutant gang member. The leader of the mutants threatened Gordon's life on TV just a few weeks ago. So Gordon is on edge as he has already gone through a few attempts on his life. Gordon hears the sound of a gun being cocked behind him. He gets ready to defend himself and he shoots and kills the attacker. It was a justified killing. But the mutant attacker was just a young teenage boy. The killing gives some bad press to Gordon, and the mayor of Gotham City and his advisors are trying to figure out who to replace Gordon with sooner rather than later. Gordon is set to retire in a few weeks, but maybe they can push him out a little quicker. They suspect once Gordon is retired, the mutant threat may subside. Whoever the next police commissioner is, one major important decision they will have to make is where they fall on the Batman issue. Will they support Batman and his vigilantism? Or will they issue a warrant for his arrest because he is a danger to society? Violence in Gotham City continues to get worse. The mutants kidnapped a 10-month-year-old baby named Kevin Ridley, who is heir to the Ridley chewing gum fortune. They demand a million dollars for his safe return. Batman, he finds where these mutant kidnappers are. Even though the mutant gang members have guns, Batman makes quick work of them, tossing them through windows, smashing them into walls. One of the mutants grabs little Kevin Ridley and has a gun to his head and is threatening to shoot him. The kidnapper warns Batman, Back off, man! I'll kill the kid! Believe me, man, I will! Believe me! Batman grabs one of the mutants' machine guns lying around, and he starts firing it. He doesn't kill anyone, but Batman does cause some injuries, and he scares the shit out of the mutant gang member that had Kevin hostage. Batman frees the hostage and turns to the kidnapper and tells him, I believe you. On the news, everyone is debating the Batman. Even though Batman clearly does good, many people still see him as a violent threat that should be removed. Newscaster Ted Koppel is hosting a debate between Arkham Asylum psychologist Dr. Wolper, the one that was working with Harvey Dent. Dr. Wolper is anti-Batman and thinks Batman does more harm than good. On the other side of the debate is Daily Planet editor Lana Lang. She is pro-Batman, and she believes Batman shows society that we have the power in our hands and we can resist. And also is Ronald Reagan's presidential media advisor, Chuck Frick. Chuck doesn't care either way on the whole Batman debate. He just wants to downplay the whole thing and not make Reagan look bad for not stepping in. Chuck says, Heck, Ted. Reagan will get around to a press conference sooner or later, but the president's got to keep his eye on the picture, you know? And this Batman flap-trap, well, it's noisy all right, that big cape and pointy ears, it's great showbiz. And you know President Reagan knows his showbiz. You just gotta keep your shorts on, Ted. Pretty soon the ratings will drop on this one and it'll blow over. Besides, I think this whole thing's just as likely a hoax. Networks have done worse. I mean, Batboy would be pushing 60 by now, if he ever was real. Funny that nobody's ever taken a picture of him. Mighty funny, I say. Elsewhere, teenage girl Carrie Kelly, inspired by Batman saving her from the mutants at the arcade recently, decides to dress up as Robin. She 
heads out into the streets in search of crimes to fight. Eventually, she comes across some mutant gang members talking about a big meeting at the Gotham City dump. Carrie decides to run there as quick as she can, hoping maybe the Batman will show up. The mayor of Gotham talks with his advisors and eventually decides to announce Ellen Yindel will be the next police commissioner of Gotham City, replacing James Gordon. He chose her primarily for her more anti-Batman stance. Once the decision is made public later on that afternoon, Ellen Yindel goes on the news, and she addresses the Batman controversy. She says, I'm surprised there is a controversy. His actions are categorically criminal. I will have him brought to trial. My first act as police commissioner will be to issue an arrest warrant for the Batman on charges of assault, breaking and entering, creating a public hazard, etc. Elsewhere, the mutant leader is at the dump, and he is hosting a big meeting with all of his gang members. He is trying to rally his gang to commit more crimes. He says they should take the guns, storm police headquarters, kill, kill, kill. He wants them to bring him Gordon's head. Batman, he has found out about the mutants gang meeting at the dump as well, and he starts driving over there in his tank-like Batmobile. Supposedly, Christopher Nolan based the Batmobile in his movies on this version. Batman eventually arrives at the dump in his Batmobile, and the gang members begin firing on him. They are using guns and hand grenades, rocket launchers, and bazookas, but it is all useless. It just bounces right off of Batman's vehicle, as it is too powerful. Batman, he bulldozes through the crowd and fires rubber bullets at all of them and takes most of the gang down. Carrie Kelly, the new female Robin, has also arrived on the scene, and she is watching from a distance. Most of the mutant gang members have been taken out. The only one really left standing is the mutant leader. The mutant leader stares down Batman's tank car and tells him, Come out, coward! Face me! I'll kill you! I'll eat your heart! Batman is contemplating what to do. Alfred, through the radio, begs Batman to come back home. Don't do this. Batman thinks he could just shoot the mutant leader right now with his tank and kill him. But Batman doesn't want to cross that line. He still doesn't want to kill. Batman wants to accept the mutant leader's challenge for one-on-one -on -one combat, but Batman is worried. He's old now, not as fast as he used to be and the mutant leader is young and in his physical prime. Batman, he decides to fight, though. He steps out of his car and faces the mutant leader in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Batman and the mutant leader fight. Batman, he gets a couple punches in, but the mutant leader is faster and claws at Batman and bites him and is more vicious. Batman gets hit in his midsection and it feels like an explosion in his body. Batman, he tries to wind up for one good shot, and he gives it everything he's got, and he hits the mutant leader right in his face, breaking the mutant's visor glasses. The mutant leader's glasses are gone, blood is flowing from his nose, but he just laughs at Batman. Batman feeds him some more punches, but the mutant leader just taunts Batman, saying, Getting tired, old man? The mutant leader then hits Batman in his back, and elbows him in his face and cracks Batman's arm and he hits Batman with a crowbar in the back of his head. Batman, he spits blood. Carrie Kelly decides to try to jump in and save Batman. She jumps on the mutant leader's back and tries to wrestle him down. Batman, he's about to pass out. But before he does, he reaches into his utility belt and throws something at the mutant leader's face that seems to knock him out. In the aftermath of the battle, Carrie manages to drag Batman back to his Batmobile, and the Batmobile on auto drive drives them away from the dump before the police arrive. The Batmobile is headed to the Batcave. During the drive, Carrie and Batman get introduced to each other. She says her name is Carrie, and Batman tells her his name is Bruce. Whoa, 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 Batman, you're just telling this girl your identity right away? Anyway. 
Carrie helps Batman with his injuries, making a splint for his arm. The mutant leader managed to get arrested, but before being put into jail, he managed to get on the news and give them a statement. He told the news, Batman is a coward. I broke his bones. I conquered the fool. I made him beg for mercy. Only by cheating did he escape alive. Let him go to his woman. Let him lick his wounds. His day is done. Gotham City belongs to the mutants. Elsewhere in Washington, D.C., President Ronald Reagan is talking with Superman. Reagan tells Superman to put a stop to Batman. Superman promises Reagan he'll try and talk with him. Over at Arkham Asylum, the idiots over there are thinking of releasing the Joker and having the Joker make a public television appearance on a talk show so they can show the world what a great job they've been doing rehabilitating criminals. Joker, he has basically been kind of comatose for the last 10 years. Although with the return of Batman, he has secretly snapped out of it. Joker, he plays along though, and he tells them how remorseful he is for his past crimes. Joker's just playing them though, saying whatever they need to hear so they'll let him out of Arkham. Eventually, Batman arrives in the Batcave with Carrie. He removes his cowl and begins trying to recover. Meanwhile, Carrie, she searches the Batcave and inspects Jason Todd's Robin uniform. On TV, the mayor says this whole mutant situation is due to James Gordon's incompetence. And the mayor is planning on meeting one-on-one -on -one with the mutant leader to negotiate some sort of settlement or agreement to end this anarchy. The mayor eventually with Gordon goes to the jail to meet with the mutant leader. Gordon asks the mayor before he goes in, are you sure you want to do this? The mayor says yes, of course. Gordon, he waits outside the cell as the mayor goes into the mutant leader's cell to talk. A few moments later, the mutant leader ripped out the mayor's throat with his teeth killing him. In the Batcave, Batman has accepted Carrie as his new Robin and agrees to work with her. Alfred asks Batman, have you forgotten what happened to Jason? Batman replies, I will never forget Jason. He was a good soldier. He honored me, but the war goes on. Bruce, he suits up as Batman again, and he goes to meet with James Gordon and tell Gordon his plans to finally once and for all end this whole mutant situation plaguing Gotham City. There are too many of the mutant gang members to arrest and keep them all. So Batman's idea is to gather all of the mutants together at the dump once again, and he will defeat their leader in front of them all. Batman knows if he does this, they will respect him, and they will see him as their new leader and he can convince the mutant gang members to stop their criminal activity. Gordon agrees to help Batman with his plan. Carrie Kelly, going undercover, walks around Gotham City and begins spreading rumors of a big must-attend mutant meeting happening down at the dump later that night, and she causes a lot of the mutant gang members to go there and spectate. James Gordon he goes to the Gotham City Jail holding cells where the mutant is being held captive. Gordon, he relieves the other officers on duty, and then he walks up to the mutant leader's cell. The mutant leader asks Gordon, You came to say hello, old man? And Gordon says, No, I came to say goodbye. Gordon opens the cell door, and then he leaves. The mutant leader is at first a little confused. When he realized Gordon opened his cell door and kind of letting him go, he decides to make his escape. The mutant leader finds a vent, and he crawls through it, and it leads directly to the Gotham City dump. And as he eventually crawls through it and gets to the other side, Batman is there waiting for him. Batman jumps the mutant leader, and the entire mutant gang is there watching on the sidelines. It is a rematch. Batman and the mutant leader fight in the mud. The reason Batman lost last time is because he wasn't fighting smart. 
He was trying to match the mutant leader's speed and savagery. This time, Batman is fighting strategically. He fights in the mud as he knows it will slow the mutant leader down. Batman cuts the mutant leader right above his eyes, and the blood eventually trickles down and makes the mutant leader blinded. Batman then gets surgical with every punch, and in the end, Batman is victorious, standing above the mutant leader. All the mutant gang members are impressed with Batman's victory. Most of them are just gullible, easily influenced young people looking for direction and inspiration. They fell in with the mutants as it gave them a sense of belonging, but now they look to Batman instead. After this, a lot of them paint a bat symbol on their face. They will abandon their previous mutant ways, and they will call themselves the Sons of the Batman. Issue 3 Hunt the Dark Knight On TV, Ronald Reagan is giving a press conference. The reporters want to know about the Cold War and the escalating tensions with the Soviet Union. They make mention to something called the Corto Maltese Crisis. Just so you all know, Corto Maltese is not a real place, it is a fictional South American nation in the DC Universe. The reporters also ask Reagan what is his position on the Batman controversy and what he plans on doing about Batman. In a humorous way to pass the buck of responsibility, Reagan says, oh, uh, that's a state issue. The government of the state can handle it. The governor of the state then goes on the news and he says that he has a whole state to look after. This is the mayor of Gotham City's responsibility. The new mayor of Gotham City says that this is his new police commissioner, Ellen Yindel's responsibility, and he doesn't want to interfere in her decision-making process. Ellen Yindel will be sworn in as the new police commissioner very soon. Now, there is this ridiculous villain we are introduced to this issue called Bruno. She is a muscular henchwoman that works for the Joker, and she has red swastikas tattooed on both her breasts, as well as her butt cheeks too. <laughs> Bruno and her crew are robbing a liquor store. Batman is undercover as an old woman. He has like one of those Mission Impossible face maker things. Batman wants to question this Bruno and find out what she knows about the Joker's plans. Things eventually get violent in the liquor store and Batman as the old woman starts fighting with Bruno and the rest of her people with her. Batman with a bottle smashes it over the head of one of Bruno's associates, and then Batman tosses some batarangs around. Eventually, Bruno tries to flee the scene, and Batman gives orders to Robin to not engage with this Bruno and not let her see her. But Robin decides to engage in combat with Bruno anyway, and Robin hits her with the slingshot. Bruno then fires her gun at Robin. It was a close call, but Robin manages to evade the bullets. Batman pursues Bruno into this rundown building. Batman tells her that she will go to jail tonight, but first she will tell him what the Joker's plans are. They fight, Bruno fires her gun some more. The building eventually collapses into the ground right around them, and they fall into the subway line down below. Batman and Bruno continue to trade some blows, now fighting underground in the subway tunnel. All of a sudden, though, Superman, who wants to talk with Batman, arrives. Superman is so fast, we don't even see him. We just see streams of light on where he flew. Superman ends this fight in, like, five seconds. He flies right through the subway wall, and he uses his laser vision to melt Bruno's gun, and then he wraps her up in some piping and knocks her out. Batman is annoyed. He thinks, not him, not now. Superman tells Batman, Bruce, we have to talk. Batman replies, I'm busy tonight. You just cost me hours. Tomorrow morning, my place. Stay out of my way until then. The news on TV that night reports about the escalating tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States, as well as the Corto Maltese crisis going on. They also report on the mutants now becoming the sons of the Batman and the Sons of the Batman warns criminals they are about to enter 
hell. Dr. Wolper on the news continues to shit on Batman and say how terrible he is. Batman and Robin continue their work. Batman does warn the new Robin though that she disobeyed his orders earlier when he said to not make herself visible to Bruno. He tells her future insubordination will not be tolerated. James Gordon on TV gives his retirement speech and officially passes on the torch of police commissioner to Ellen Yindel. Ellen Yindel thanks Gordon and then she publicly declares her position on the Batman. She says, Despite Gotham's plague of crime, I believe our only recourse is law enforcement. I will not participate in the activities of a vigilante. Therefore, as your police commissioner, I issue this arrest order for the Batman on charges of breaking and entering assault and battery and creating a public menace. So Batman is now officially a wanted felon. Batman and Robin travel across the city and climb into the apartment of one of the Joker's henchmen named Abner. Abner is a mentally ill demolitions expert who tinkers with robots and things. As Batman and Robin enter the apartment, Abner is not there, but he left one of his robots behind named Mary, and Mary is rigged to blow. Luckily, Batman gets Robin and himself out of the apartment in the nick of time as it explodes. Later on in the news, they report that 12 people died. The Joker, he sleeps in his cell in Arkham that night. Tomorrow, he will be free and appear on television on the David Indochrin show. By the way, David Indochrin is clearly drawn to be David Letterman. <laughs> on his show that night, David Indochrin promotes tomorrow's controversial appearance by the Joker. The next morning, Batman and Superman have their meeting in their civilian clothes. Clark wants to talk to Bruce because President Reagan wanted him to. Clark warns Bruce that sooner or later, the president may order him to bring Bruce in. Bruce is not scared of Superman. He tells Clark, when that happens, Clark, may the best man win. At that moment, Ronald Reagan on TV tells the American people that America is now engaged in direct combat with Soviet troops in the Corto Maltese. He tells them, though, not to worry. They have God on their side. Or the next best thing, anyway, referring to Superman. Reagan then winks to the camera as he says this. As Clark and Bruce talk, Clark overhears Soviet planes flying out of range. He has to go leave right now to deal with this. Clark changes into his Superman outfit and flies into the clouds, and he causes these two Soviet planes to blow up in midair. As Superman is flying, he narrates, The rest of us learn to cope. The rest of us recognize the danger of the endless envy of those not blessed. Diana, referring to Wonder Woman, went back to her people. Hal, referring to Green Lantern, went to the stars. And I have walked the razor's edge for so long, but you, Bruce, you with your wild obsession. Through Superman's narration, we learn of the state of superheroes in the DC universe in this continuity. The president has apparently placed the superheroes under certain rules. Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and others have abided by these rules or gone away. Superman is working directly for the president and the United States government, so he at least still gets to do good, although he is controlled. But Batman, he just arrogantly continues to do whatever he wants. Now it is time for the Joker's big TV appearance. He is getting ready at Arkham Asylum. Abner tells Joker everything is ready for tonight. He gives Joker some nose plugs. At the TV studio, Ellen Yindel and the police are gathered on the roof to capture Batman if he arrives, and also to stop the Joker if he tries anything. Batman and Robin are getting ready and fly over to the TV studio in a helicopter. Batman tells Robin this is strictly an observation mission for her. She is not to leave the chopper. The David Indochrin show has started filming. 
Davey does his monologue. Backstage, Dr. Walper tells Joker, just be yourself. David has his first guest on, some sort of sex expert. Abner, somewhere else in Gotham City, sends his other robot, Bobby, to fly over to the TV studio to assist the Joker. Batman in his chopper arrives at the TV studio and is hovering up above. He exits the helicopter and with his cape glides down to the roof of the TV studio. Ellen Yindel and the police are ready to arrest Batman. Batman throws some smoke bombs and plans to fight through the police and get into the TV studio to stop whatever the Joker is probably planning. On the TV show, David in Doc Rin is talking to his co-host and he says, What can I say about our next guest that hasn't been said before, Paul? And Paul, his sidekick, says, He's a kook, Dave! A maniac! A real lunatic! No, I mean it! He's a nut! The Joker finally comes out on stage. The TV cameras are filming him. The audience is looking. Joker, he walks out with his psychologist, Dr. Walper. When the Joker finally sits down, Dave jokes with the Joker and says, You said to have only killed about 600 people, Joker. Now don't take this the wrong way, but I think you've been holding out on us. Joker answers, I don't keep count. I'm going to kill everyone in this room. Joker, he then proceeds to kiss the previous guest, the sex expert. And with that kiss, he has some toxins in his lipstick and it makes her go mad and plasters a big smile on her face. While all of this is going on downstairs, Batman is still on the roof trying to fight through the police. Abner's doll manages to fly right into the TV studio. When it does, it starts emitting a poison gas bomb, killing everyone inside. 206 people total, as well as David and Docker and, and Dr. Walper. The Joker is unaffected, though, thanks to the nose plugs he was given earlier by Abner. Joker, he then manages to make his escape from the studio in all of the commotion. Batman, he did manage to fight through the police on the roof, but he did not make it into the studio in enough time to stop the Joker, so he was forced to retreat back to the chopper with Robin. Elsewhere, Superman, who is working closely with the US government, is now in Corto Maltese, fighting the Soviets directly on behalf of the president along with US troops. The Joker makes a stop at Kyle Escorts for the night to see Selina Kyle. Selina Kyle used to be Catwoman. Selina is now leading this escort agency. She has pink hair and looks much older. The Joker tells her the years have not been kind to her. The Joker knows one of Kyle's girls named Elsie is seeing a congressman tonight. Joker demands to see her. When he does see her, he uses some sort of mind control drug on her. Elsie, she eventually goes to see that congressman that night, and under the mind control drug, she then drugs the congressman herself. And that congressman then goes crazy. He goes on the roof of this large skyscraper wearing nothing but the American flag, and he is yelling, calling for a nuclear strike on Corto Maltese and the news media is filming him. The congressman then jumps from the building, leaping to his death. Batman and Robin eventually follow the trail of this dead congressman back to Selina Kyle. There, Batman finds Selina tied up, abused, and dressed like Wonder Woman. Joker must have done some sick, perverted stuff to her while he was alone with her. Selina is crying. She tells Batman that the Joker is worse than ever. He is using lipstick to mind control people. She tells Batman about one of her girls, Elsie, that was with the congressman. She also says one of her other girls, Mary, is with the governor now. And she worries what Joker will have forced her to do. Robin also finds some poison cotton candy. Batman deduces that Joker must be headed to the county fair. He must be planning to distribute that poison cotton candy to others. He might kill thousands. Batman and Robin quickly leave to stop the Joker. Before they do, though, Batman kisses Selina Kyle, his old flame. While Batman and Robin are heading to the county fair to face the Joker, 
we see Superman still battling the Soviets in Corto Maltese, destroying planes, sinking battleships, and taking down many other soldiers. At the county fair, Joker and Abner are at a stand, and they are handing out free poison cotton candy to all that want it. Once they kill many children this way, they then move on to a roller coaster to plant a bomb. This is when Batman and Robin arrive by way of a hang glider. Abner says he will go on the roller coaster and make sure this bomb goes off. Eventually, Batman ends up following the Joker into a house of mirrors, while Robin goes after Abner on the roller coaster trying to stop this bomb. The roller coaster with Abner is moving. Robin manages to grab onto one of the roller coaster cars. Abner attempts to shoot at Robin. Robin avoids the bullets and fires her slingshot at one of Abner's robots and hits it. The robot was the source of the bomb, and the robot gets flung free of all the civilians on the coaster, and it explodes safely away from everyone. This pisses Abner off, so he starts crawling over these roller coaster cars to get to Robin. He eventually gets on top of her and starts strangling her. Robin is going to die, but the roller coaster makes one of these steep turns and Abner gets flung off, he goes flying, and he slams down so hard on the tracks below that he instantly dies from the impact. Robin, she starts tearing up a little bit. This is a lot for a 13-year-old girl to deal with. While that was happening, Batman followed Joker into a house of mirrors. Batman, he smashed through some of the mirrors and tried to take the Joker down. Joker, he gets a few shots off from his gun and he slips away from the house of mirrors and continues running through the fair. Joker, he heads into the tunnel of love. Batman follows in after him. In the tunnel of love, Batman and Joker take part in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They are wrestling. Batman, he still does not want to cross that line and kill the Joker. But in the course of their fighting, Batman, he settles for snapping the Joker's neck and leaving him paralyzed. Joker is disappointed Batman didn't kill him and he says, I'm really very disappointed with you, my sweet. The moment was perfect and you didn't have the nerve. Paralysis? Really? The Joker, as a last act of defiance, starts trying to twist his body with all his might, and somehow he manages to snap his own neck and kill himself. As he does this, he manages to get out one last evil laugh. <laughs> the Joker killed himself because he knew there's no way the authorities would believe that Batman didn't do it. They will believe that Batman crossed that line he always said he wouldn't cross. Batman holds the wound he has in his chest. He tries to stop the bleeding. For a moment, he sits there beside the Joker and tries to regain his composure. Batman narrates, Whatever's in him rustles as it leaves. The sirens echo through the tunnel. Tires screech. The world is growing dark and cold. Issue 4, The Dark Knight Falls Ellen Yindel and the police force make their way into the Tunnel of Love in pursuit of Batman and the Joker. Batman is badly wounded and cornered. Batman, he spits on Joker's body and then he quickly comes up with a plan. He doesn't have the strength to fight through all of these police and make his way out of the tunnel. So he decides to rig Joker's body with explosives. Batman, he waits for the police to get close to the Joker, and then he sets off the explosives. Batman doesn't want to kill any of the police, he just wants to scare them to give himself an opening and space to run from them and get out of the tunnel. So far Batman's plan is working and the explosives have gone off. Batman, he then reaches into his utility belt and throws a few more explosive distraction devices around. He then books it out of the tunnel, and he radios Robin to call in the chopper and prepare for them both to leave. Eventually, both of them manage to fight their way through the police, 
get to the chopper, and get out of there and head back to the Batcave. When they arrive at the Batcave, Alfred takes a look at Batman's wounds and operates on him. Batman's wounds are bad, but Alfred says he will live. On the news, they report on further incidents of the Sons of Batman thwarting crime across Gotham City. One such crime stop was a robbery of a convenience store by a bunch of thieves wearing Nixon masks. Over at the Gotham City Jail, some former mutant gang members that haven't converted to the Sons of the Batman yet are still locked up. Their lawyer is trying to get them released, arguing his clients are all minors and they should be returned to the care of their parents. After the lawyer's statement, 71 of the parents signed a petition directed towards the mayor urging for their children not to be released. They don't want them back. <laughs> a special report takes over the news broadcast. President Reagan is in a hazmat suit and has something to tell the American people. He says, Well folks, I've got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> The good news is that the Soviets have withdrawn their forces from the island of Corto Maltese. And the bad news, well, it looks like those Soviets are pretty bad losers, yes they are. So essentially, the Soviets got pissed about losing in Corto Maltese due to Superman intervening, so they have resorted to firing their nuke at the island. Superman immediately flies up into the air to intercept the nuke. Superman, he is flying right ahead of it. He grabs onto the nuke and he struggles to make it veer off course. Superman, he thinks to himself, 20 million die by fire if I am weak. Superman, with all of his strength, manages to make the warhead change direction by 20 degrees. The warhead then detonates in a desert away from large population centers. Superman has saved the day once again. But Superman is right there when it goes off, and he is engulfed by the nuclear bomb. The bomb the Soviets used was not a normal nuclear bomb. It was something called a Coldbringer, designed to induce environmental effects of a full-scale nuclear war. It is designed to cause maximum damage to the environment, but spare the industrial sites politicians regard so highly. The aftershock of the nuke going off created a pulse that blacked out almost all of America, killing all electricity and electronic devices. Bruce Wayne, at the time, was recovering at his mansion with Alfred and Robin by his side, and he realizes what just happened, that the nuke went off. Bruce, he says out loud, Clark, you idiot! You let them do it! I always knew you would. Gotham City, as well as other cities in America, are plunged into chaos. Scared people, rioting, looting, fires, etc. At the Gotham City Jail, the mutants that were locked up there revolt against the guards and turn their guns on them. They manage to break out of their cell and flee. Elsewhere in Gotham City, an airplane with all of its electronics dead crashes and explodes into the side of a building. Batman and Robin, they suit up and they head out into the streets. Since their car is useless due to the nuclear fallout killing all electronics, they head out on horseback. Batman and Robin ride their horses to the dump to rally the sons of the Batman and the former mutant members that have showed up there as well. Batman knows that he must rely on them in order to save Gotham City from the chaos. Batman talking to the mutants and the sons of the Batman says to them, Boys, girls, I'm here to appeal to your community spirit. I'm sure you're all eager to help. The fact that Batman is willing to turn to former criminals for help in restoring order shows how dire the situation is. We then get this badass splash page of Batman riding a horse along with Robin and the sons of the Batman and the mutants charging behind him. Ellen Yindel at one point sees Batman and his big army and she is asked by her officers if they should try and arrest the Batman. But after all the chaos and seeing what Batman has put together, she says, No, no, he's too big now. We jump back over to Superman. He is still alive, even after being there at the heart of the nuclear blast. He is alive, but he is not looking good. He is thin, 
His body looks shriveled up, almost corpse-like. A magnetic storm begins electrocuting Superman. Superman is normally powered by the yellow sun's light rays. The problem is, though, because of the nuclear bomb and the ensuing nuclear winter, the sky is completely blocked out and the sun can't get through. Superman is weak and he is crawling on the ground. He is reaching out to the sky, begging for the sun to shine through the clouds so he can regain some strength and not die. The sun does not show itself, though. Superman, he is touching the grass and the flowers on the ground. And somehow, he is able to draw upon the stored energy from the sun out of the plant life, which also draws upon solar energy for its food. So by Superman doing this, he is able to get powered enough to fly away somewhere safe. One week later, after the bomb went off, the power has finally returned. Gotham City, along with the rest of the world, though, is still experiencing a nuclear winter from the fallout of the bomb. And it is snowing in Gotham, even though it is August. There is growing animosity and competition between Batman and Superman, and it appears that both of them are gearing towards some sort of confrontation. Superman, who now seems to be in better health, is talking with President Reagan. He tells Reagan, no sir, I'm afraid Batman will never let me bring him in alive. Batman, he is talking with Oliver Queen, aka Green Arrow. Green Arrow is now an old man smoking a pipe. The two of them make plans to work together in the coming confrontation with Superman. Green Arrow specifically is pissed at Superman because apparently Superman is the reason he only has one arm right now. Green Arrow tells Bruce, I always knew it would get down to you and the big blue schoolboy. Planet's too big for the two of you. When it all comes down, I want a piece of him. A small piece will do, for old time's sake, you know? On the news, they report that every city in America, New York, Chicago, Metropolis, is all caught in the grip of a national panic. Everywhere except Gotham City, where Batman and the sons of the Batman have kept the peace. Gotham streets are safe, unless you try to commit a crime. Superman, with his laser vision in the sky, eventually asks Bruce, where? Bruce tells Superman, Crime Alley. The final confrontation between Batman and Superman is set. Later on, Batman suits up. He has all sorts of preparations and plans in motion. And then he heads off and gets ready to go toe to toe with Superman. It is now time for the big epic fight between the two of them. Superman flies in. Batman fires several Hunter missiles at him. He wants to see how Superman will handle them. He wants to assess how strong Superman is after his run-in with the nukes recently. Batman theorizes that if Superman was at full strength, he would easily dodge these Hunter missiles. Instead though, Superman just gets smacked around by them for a bit. So clearly Superman is not at full strength. Robin in one of Batman's tanks shoots at Superman with a charge that is so strong it could sink a battleship. Superman, he feels the blast. And after he absorbs it, Superman rips the tank open and finds Robin inside. Robin, with her slingshot, is prepared to fire it at Supes, but she's scared. A little slingshot won't really do much to Superman. Superman just looks at her and tells her, isn't tonight a school night? Superman, he then finally goes to confront Batman. Batman has a specially built suit to protect himself. He also has a sonic gun weapon, and he fires it at Superman, and it causes Supes to have a slight nosebleed. Superman is now closer to Batman. Batman, he taps into the city's power grid, and he grabs Superman's head and attempts to electrocute him. Batman, then with the suit, feeds Superman a punch. Superman has had enough of Batman's nonsense, though, and he rips off Batman's helmet and mask and says, Bruce, this is idiotic. You're just meat and bone like all the rest. The two trade some blows back and forth. Superman hits Batman with a blow that breaks some of Batman's ribs. Batman, he fires some acid into Superman's face. 
In the distance, Green Arrow is hanging from a ladder, up high in a building. Even with only one arm, Green Arrow doesn't miss his shots. He aims his bow and arrow, and he has a special kryptonite arrow Batman supplied him with. Green Arrow fires the kryptonite arrow at Superman. Superman, he manages to catch the arrow before it hits him. But that doesn't matter, because the arrow still explodes, and the kryptonite gets all over Superman. With Superman weakened from the kryptonite, Batman manages to feed some blows to him, and they hurt him. Superman, even though he is now losing the fight, starts becoming concerned for Batman. He hears Batman's heart, and it is beating irregularly, slowly. Batman, he continues to feed blows to Superman. And as Batman is punching, he narrates, This is the end for both of us. We could have changed the world. Now look at us. I have become a political liability in you. You're a joke. I want you to remember, Clark, in all the years to come, in your most private moments, I want you to remember my hand at your throat. I want you to remember the one man who beat you. With Superman weakened from the kryptonite and Batman feeding blows, it is starting to become clear that Batman would have won this fight. Only problem is Batman's heart gives out and flatlines. Superman eventually holds Bruce in his arms, and eventually the police come to the scene. Superman, sad that his friend has died, tells the police, Don't touch him! Elsewhere, Alfred destroys Wayne Manor, setting it to self-destruct, so that all evidence of Batman and his methods are also destroyed. Alfred, he waits outside and watches the manor go down, and as he watches, Alfred has a stroke, collapses, and dies. On the news, it is revealed to the world that Bruce Wayne was in fact Batman, and that he has died. Apparently, Bruce had his entire fortune liquidated. Every bank account and stock sold and emptied, and the money moved somewhere secret. There is a funeral for Bruce Wayne. In attendance are many. We see Clark Kent there, as well as James Gordon and Selina Kyle. Selina yells at Clark, You son of a bitch! I know who killed him! After the funeral is over, Clark and Carrie, or Robin, are the only two left at the grave. Clark gets ready to leave, but all of a sudden, he hears Bruce's heartbeat start beating again. Bruce is not dead, it was a ruse. It was a plan of Bruce's to fake his own death slow his heartbeat enough to make everyone believe that he was gone. That way, the pressure for everyone to stop Batman would go away. Bruce did not intend on Clark figuring it out, but his timing wasn't precise enough. He didn't think Clark would still be here right now, and that Clark would hear his heart beating. Clark, though, rather than be angry, realizes what is happening. He realizes that his friend is still alive, and... He decides to just let it go. Clark, he winks at Robin, signifying he gets it, and he leaves. On the final page, we see Bruce is alive again and back underground, meeting with the sons of Batman as well as Robin, and instructing them all on what they need to do in order to make their next comeback. Bruce narrates, Superman, you'll leave me alone for now. In return, I'll stay quiet. So will Robin and the rest. We have many years, as many as we need. Years to train and study and plan. Here in the endless cave, far past the burnt remains of a crime fighter whose time has passed. It begins here, an army, to bring sense to a world plagued by worse than thieves and murders. This will be a good life. Good enough. And that is the end of Batman The Dark Knight Returns. Alright, so that was The Dark Knight Returns. I hope you enjoyed my breakdown of it. Now let me go through some of my thoughts on the story and why I think this book works so well. So first of all, on a surface level, it is just an epic story of Batman coming out of retirement and sort of 
rebuilding himself. We have a Harvey Dent battle in here. This whole mutant group, the Joker, and it builds to this epic confrontation between Batman and Superman, finally answering the question, who would win in a fight between the two? Most people would say Superman would win, of course, but Batman is a master planner, and in this book, he plans his way out and basically wins, although he fakes his death, so Superman kind of wins in the end, but really, Batman won. Come on, we know it. <laughs> so, I love all that. I love, also, the commentary in here, the political, social commentary, talking about the Soviet uh, Union and the war, the Cold War, and nuclear war. I love the commentary on the media and society and all the little talking heads on TV within this book sort of debating the Batman and vigilantism. So all that is really great. The 16-panel grid structure is also really interesting. It really puts a lot on the page. And the book is kind of frantically jumping all over the place. You know, we're following the story, and then we're reading some of the talking head media stuff. And then we have Ronald Reagan popping in over here. So that is one of the charms for the book, but it can be a little bit off-putting and distracting to some people. The artwork in this book is not for everybody. Frank Miller definitely has a style. And this is not the prettiest artwork by any means. I think it totally works for what the book is going for. But I get if not everyone is into it. But on the whole, I think this book just does so much right. And there's so many interesting things in here. Things explored. Epic moments. Batman just riding this horse with the sons of the Batman. Uh, this female Robin character, also really interesting. So, uh, there's just so many great things in here. And uh, I think there is a reason most people put this as one of their favorite Batman books of all time. I think for me, it is my favorite Batman book of all time. I get some of you may think it is overhyped, and you may not agree with it being the best Batman book ever, but you can't debate that it is not influential because it definitely is. It really changed the comic game. So, uh, yeah, fantastic book. I'm going to give this one a 9.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Curious to hear any of your thoughts on The Dark Knight Returns and its place in history.